Hello everybody. Uh, you're going to share this week with me and my cough. Um, and I'm sorry I can't do anything about that. Um, it's uh, one of those things. Uh, oh, it's holistic science, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Holistic science. Mm. That's right. Good. Well, that's a good beginning. I've yeah. got that far. Holistic science. Yeah, last week was dancing with Chinese dancing, but this week's holistic <laughs> <laughs> science. This week's holistic science, good. Ooh, a machine there. Uh, right, okay, well, I've got two problems with holistic science. One holistic, two science. <laughs> That's my difficulty. Right, so, first of all, um, let's look at the word holistic. Um, it, it's a new word. To many of you, it won't seem that way because of your age. But to me, it's a new word. It didn't actually come in until the very beginning of the 1970s or the end of the 1960s at the earliest. Um, before that, we never had that word. Uh, the word holism did exist. That word was uh, coined by Jan Smuts, who a uh, South African, and he became a sort of philosopher, and he became one point president of South Africa. And in the late 1920s, 26 or 28, I can't remember, he wrote about holism. This word never caught on. Very few people ever used it. The only people in England who ever used it were people who were foreigners anyway. Uh, continentals, like Arthur Kirstler. Nobody liked Arthur Kirstler anyway, so that didn't help the word either. So it didn't catch on, didn't holism. Um, the word that we used was wholeness and the whole. Very simple. Um, and my first encounters with the kind, these kinds of questions came at the beginning of the 1960s, 1962, uh, when I uh, went to Birkbeck College and University of London and became a postgraduate research student under Professor David Bohm, who had just moved there from Bristol. And I was there with him it was just over two, 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 two and a half, three years. And I, at that time, and now many of you will of course know about Bohm's work, um, but of course this is a much earlier period of time, um, and uh, he, he was very much concerned with the, the, the problem of wholeness in the quantum theory and whether there could be such a thing or, or not. And that was, for me, my introduction. And I, I, I worked particularly on the, the, the problem of wholeness in quantum physics. Um, but again, the, the word was wholeness. Um, and there are various other things, but in the beginning of the 1970s, uh, the word holistic was introduced and it came from America, and it came particularly from California. And as far as I can see, its origin was in the work on the two halves of the brain, uh, the work of Sperry and various other people. And it was very much popularized by a, a, a student or research associate, or whatever, of Sperry's called Robert Ornstein who wrote a book called The Psychology of Consciousness. It was actually a very, very interesting book. And here, uh, this whole business of the, as it were, the two hemispheres of the brain was discussed. And so and this is where the notion that one hemisphere was holistic, this is where the word holistic really came in. Uh, it, apparently also the word didn't exist in German, um, so it wasn't just a peculiarity of English. And uh, there was quite a lot of excitement. I found, the, found it, the notion quite interesting, but I didn't at first occur to me to associate it, funnily enough, with wholeness in other, in other areas I was interested in. But it all went uh, pear-shaped or belly-up or whatever the disgusting expression is that people use today, <coughs> because um, the, 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 he got exaggerated. The idea that there were two hemispheres of the brain and one, that one was holistic, and intuitive and all that, and the other was analytical and separative and, and, and rational and all of that. Now, this actually isn't, it isn't actually like that, but what happened was new age, new age type people got hold of this and feminists got hold of this. 
And when I was a, a boy, there was a, a kind of little question went round, which was, um, what are little boys made of? And the answer was snaps and snails and puppy dog tails. What are little girls made of? Sugar and spice and all things nice. And basically, the people who got hold of this divided brain system just did it this way. One side of the brain was sugar and spa spice and all things like And hey, guess, that's feminine. And then the other side was snaps and snails and puppy dog tails. Nasty, analytical, rational thinking. Oh, that's male. And of course, it's a load of bollocks. And what happened is, um, everyone turned, eventually, it, it, people who were doing this kind of research were so shocked at this they dropped the whole business for decades and no one actually doing serious work would, would talk about this at all and it's only more recently that a much more sensible and interesting and intelligent approach has started to be taken again they've got past that kind of nonsense and the, the, new, the new book by Ian McGilchrist the master and his emissary goes into this in considerable detail in many very interesting ways. And the point about it is that every single function is, is expressed through both sides of the brain. So you can't say, oh yes, well I see language, that's not very nice, is it? Put things into words, it spoils the lovely intuition. Oh, that's the left-hand side of the brain. Um, no, the language actually is expressed and manifested through both sides of the brain. Everything is expressed, manifests through both sides of the brain. And so there are these two, two different, uh, different elements. It's not that you can divide it up into two lists, snaps and cells and puppy dogs tails on one side, sugar and spice and all things nice on the other side. So there is a great deal of um, possib there's possibility now that there might be a renewed interest in this which could have a more serious basis to it. Um, and this again puts the whole business of this um, holistic aspect of the, the, of the right brain on the map again. But we don't know yet. It's too early to tell. It's a big book and reading it, as I have been doing, many, many interesting things in it, but it's difficult sometimes to tell whether he's actually concluding from work on the brain or whether he's reading into it from elsewhere, from his vast reading and so on and that. And it's not at all clear. But um, I mention this because this, this, uh, this was the original area in which the word holistic was introduced. And now it's sort of coming back, that area is coming back again. Is that clear? Have a garbled that. Could you follow it? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, the, but actually, well, anyway, after that, the word holistic didn't catch on, um, uh, and uh, nobody used it. And this, this kind of thing, this silliness about the two halves of the brain, just sort of m m meant that uh, people weren't interested in it. But gradually, over time, it, it did begin to come in, um, and. Uh, <sighs> I, even in physics, I've seen that Roger Penrose in his The Road to Reality actually does in one place use the word holistic with, with regard to certain aspects of quantum mechanics. This is new. People could have used that word with regard to quantum mechanics a long time ago, but nobody seemed inclined to use the word holistic, I think because of this, this, this origin and this nonsense that came with it, a very new aging. They didn't want to know this. And uh, in philosophy, and I'm thinking here of European philosophy, um, which has been an area in which I have uh, spent a great deal of my time, and have done and, and do. Um, it's possible to see uh, that the whole discovery of lived experience, experience as lived, not lived in the past sense of the term, the experience that has been lived, which is the great discovery of phenomenology, shows that lived experience itself is intrinsically holistic. And this, I'll talk about this more later. There's been a huge shift here, where this, this begins right back at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but it's only become clearer in recent decades. Um, th this is what has been this, this wholeness, this intrinsic wholeness of lived experience, is what has been discovered. Um, um, what, in one or two cases, you, you now find the word holistic creeping in. 
to books on European philosophy. I mean, it's pretty obvious to anyone who looks at what Heidegger is describing in um, Division One, Book One of Being and Time, that he's describing the, the he's describing the world of immediate experience in a completely holistic way. And people now do actually use that that term. But this is new. It's only in, only in the last uh, <coughs> since since the 1990s or even later that people have started to <coughs> to talk like that. <coughs> Otherwise, the, the term holistic has been used elsewhere in other kinds of areas, which you'll know more about than I am, but it hasn't entered into the mainstream. There was something I was going to say, and it went through my mind, and it's gone out the other side, so that's that. Oh, well, never mind. So... Uh, this, this, see, this word holistic, when applied to science, does cause people uh, some sort of difficulty because we're not just talking about being holistic here, which you can do in a, any kind of way you like. You can do it seriously or you can do it in a new agey way or whatever way you want. But here we're talking about something called holistic science. And people, we've got, people want, there are people who want to take this seriously. And this causes people a difficulty because they don't understand what you, what could mean by talking about holistic science. Now, th th that word, that expression, in that sense, was actually introduced by Brian Goodwin. It was his, it was his brainchild. Uh, the, 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 he, he started to talk about holistic science. Um, and so far as I can see, uh, once you look at it in this kind of way, um, that there are a number of areas where wholeness is an important factor. And that um, these, uh, these cannot be reduced to some common essence that they have in common. They're more like family resemblances. So, for example, if you take a... This is one of Wittgenstein's metaphors. If you take a family photograph, uh, an extended family photograph, then you can look at them and you say, Oh, look! Jimmy's got Aunt Agatha's ears. Oh, oh, look, Sarah's got her grandfather's eyes, and so on. You see family resemblances. Well, it's similar here with the use of the word holistic in regard to holistic science. There's no such thing as holistic science. There's no science you can go and study which is holistic. Um, but there are different things which have holistic features to them, and what Brian was interested in, first of all, which was what... what uh, drew him to it, I think, in the first place, uh, was um, the, the work he did on morphogenesis with, uh, in, in biology, with the embryology, the developmental biology of, of organisms, where he saw that there were features of wholeness in the, the, way, in, in the development of organisms and that these features were not taken into account by mainstream science, which was far too... Um, um, analytical um, atomistic in its approach and now he wasn't the only person to see that kind of thing I mean his, he did his PhD in biology under Waddington in Edinburgh with Waddington was a very famous man and he and others had come across this and also in, in, in continental Europe people like Dalk and so on and others um, had come across th this kind of thing but he was not part of the mainstream at all uh, especially uh, after the the uh, <clears throat> the renewed interest in Darwin, which really only came in the, at the end of the 1950s. Uh, an awful lot of nonsense is talked about Darwin today, Darwinism. My God, it's a load of rubbish what people say. You have to look at the history. Um, Darwinism was really invented in 1959, and not 1859 with the publication of Darwin's book. It was the centenary year of Darwin, and there was a number of men, and I presume some women were one at least, Gertrude Hillfarb, who actually decided to put Darwin on the map in a certain way and make a big thing. So that's when Darwinism really got going. You'd probably be surprised to know that Darwin uh, more or less petered out. Um, in, after about the early 1900s, right through until the end of the 1900s, in the 20s, Darwin was at such a low ebb, nobody bothered to mention him. And when I was at school uh, in the 50s, um, in biology, you could do the whole of biology without ever mentioning Darwin or mentioning evolution. Um, in, in, um, in the A-level, there was a special section which you studied at the end. 
um, and since yet the syllabus was vast anyway, uh, they usually missed it out. Because uh, there would be one question in it on the paper, and it was an optional question, so you didn't even bother. So evolution tended to get missed out. It wasn't considered to be all that important. Uh, what was important was more looking at the organism and, and that sort of thing. But it, later on, of course, everything got turned around and re-expressed in terms of Darwinism. And now people imagine that, in fact, it was like that from the very beginning. <coughs> uh, very, very far from it. People have back-projected a post-1950s Darwin onto a post-1850s Darwin. This happens all the time in the history of science. So we've got a, an, an understanding now which is simply back to front. But certainly by the time we're talking about it in the 60s, Darwinism had, was becoming a prevalent force. And that, 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 there's, that, there's nothing wrong with the whole idea of natural selection, etc., etc. Though I do wish people would get it right and realise it's, not, it's, not, it's not, not a mechanism. That there are internal changes in the organism which are selected and those changes in the organism come first. People always make out it's some kind of mechanistic influence of the environment on the organism, which it's not. A number of people writing about Darwinism will get that wrong, it's beyond belief. Why am I talking about Darwinism? I don't want to, yes, because of Brian Goodwin, that's right. Um, because Brian actually brought out there were these other sides of things which could not actually be understood in that kind of way. So morphogenesis, the development of form, was for him a primary thing in his life. Um, but then one of the other things that he saw... Uh, also had this holistic feature and that was because Brian was this unique combination that he not only did he have a degree in biology and then a PhD from Waddington but he then went to Cambridge and did a degree in mathematics so he had the best of both worlds as it were and he was one of the few biologists who actually really could do mathematical mathematics <coughs> and of course this uh, <coughs> <coughs> came up with his interest in non-linear dynamical systems, uh, otherwise misleadingly referred to as chaotic systems. And there again, as you know much more about it than I do, you get features which are of wholeness appearing in these non-linear dynamical systems. And Brian realised that these could also, of course, uh, be involved with life and the Stuart Kaufman and all that sort of business, which you know about them. I'm not, I'm not up to speed on that kind of thing at all. So that was another area where wholeness came in to Brian. Um, and uh, then, of course, another area uh, which he got, I don't know how he got interested in Goethe, but he did. Uh, Through his wife, I think. What's his wife? Pearl. Pearl. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it suddenly dawned on me just now. The number of times we've talked about Goethe, the number of times we did things together on Goethe, the number of, of workshops we've done on Goethe, and I suddenly realised now I, I had no idea how he got interested in Goethe. Mm. It was his wife. Mm. Well, you, you get interested in a lot of things because of our wives, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there we are. Um, and he got interested in Goethe, who was obviously concerned with, with, with as a way of seeing nature, in which wholeness is absolutely fundamental. So there are these three things, Brian, morphogenesis, um, non-linear dynamical systems, and Goethe, are very different things. But he saw they all had this holistic side to them. And this is the family resemblance. Don't say, now, what have these three, these three things got in common? What's the common essence? Because that essence would be what is holistic. It's not like that at all. Um, it's just that th here are three aspects in which there are sciences which have got uh, wholeness features strongly in them. And therefore, we could talk about holistic science in the sense that there's a family resemblance between these. But don't look for some deep essence which shows how it is that they're all really, um, at some deeper level, fundamentally the same. It isn't like that. And so I think that might be helpful, especially for people... Someone was saying to me last night, you were saying last night, that in talking to people, that they, they, they were interested and wanted to be interested, but were afraid it might be flaking. So I think what I've just said is, is valuable... Um, well, I think it's valuable because if you've got to talk to people, um, you can take different approaches. But there are people who would take the holistic approach much more seriously if they thought it was serious. But if they think it's flaky, new agey, they won't want anything to do with it. I'm one of them. Um, without any doubt. I'm often much happier with ordinary scientists than I am with holistic people. 
because at least they've got some discipline in what they're doing and it's not all over the place. So, you know, I have great hopes for holistic science and biotech, but I think it needs to be taken very seriously. <clears throat> but what I've just said might actually be helpful in, in, in talking to people, making people realize, you know, well, there's something real here, you know. <clears throat> now, the same thing goes for the second word which gives me trouble, science. Am I talking too quickly? No. I'm, I'm talking quickly because I'm desperately trying to remember what it was I was going to say. <laughs> um, the second word, science, has exactly the same thing to it. It's a question of family. There's no such thing as science. There are sciences. And they are actually, c can be very different. Uh, originally, it wasn't necessarily so because science, well, you won't. Let's put it this way. I won't go back. I won't go into that, no. Um, there are family resemblances between things called sciences, which is good enough to enable us to call them that. But we should think in terms of sciences, not in terms of science. Um, the physics is different from uh, geology. Uh, uh, biology is, is, is different, and, and so on. And they have their, they all have their own ways. They have their own feeling to them. They have their own ways of doing things. Um, now, there have, of course, been many attempts to, uh, to try to reduce the sciences to one. The most popular attempt used to be to reduce all the sciences to physics, um, which uh, people claimed worked, but it's quite clear it didn't work. But in a way, these things have to be tried out. I always remember people going on about the Genome Project, and I said, well, the Genome Project is a damn good thing. It's really a fantastic thing. It should be encouraged. Why? Not because it's going to find the truth. It is. But the truth it's going to find is actually one that's different to what they expect to find. And then they'll know. So when the Genome Project finally comes out, we are hey, there just isn't enough there uh, to deal with the diversity. Oh my God, we've got a whole new range of problems. What we thought would be the ultimate foundation turns out to tell us virtually nothing about difference. And therefore, the Genome Project was to be encouraged. But before, people were saying, oh, you surely can't believe in that kind of thing. It's so mechanistic, so materialistic, so reductionistic. No, do it. Go the whole hog, including the postage. Just do it. Go through it to the end. Once you've gone on to something like that, you have to do that because then only then can you see the truth which will emerge, which actually will almost invariably turn out to be different from what you were projecting into it and what you were so certain was going to come out. So, <coughs> I mentioned the genome project as an example of something. What was it an example of? Can you remember? What were sciences and... Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, Yes, if you want to reduce all the sciences to physics, then uh, try it. Try and do it. What Carnap did, Rudolf Carnap did, from the Vienna Circle in the 1920s, perhaps you haven't heard the name Rudolf Carnap, but his influence in America was enormous. He went to Chicago to escape from the Nazis. Uh, and uh, he had an enormous influence in, in, in America. And this reductionist program of a unified science can be found by reducing all sciences to physics as their common core. Well, it doesn't work. Um, and then eventually people see that this doesn't work. But if you, you've got to try and make it work and then see that it doesn't work, and sometimes these things take 50 years to do. It's, it's like that. Th things are, they don't just happen overnight. And once you get, people get onto a track... They've sort of got to continue it to the end. There's a certain point. And they can't go back. They've got to continue it to the end and see where it comes out. Um, and so there's, there have been many attempts, therefore, to reduce, the, to reduce the sciences to something, common essence, which they could all have in common. And phys physics was one that they chose. But then there's others I'll mention more later. These don't work. So now people think the best thing to do is to think in terms of family resemblances. You see, originally, I don't want to get into this because it's a big story, and I have to explain why, but <clears throat> originally it looked as if 
At an earlier stage, it looked as if the sciences <coughs> might have a common essence, uh, because the sciences actually developed from Aristotle. And Aristotle had a methodology which is called the double movement. Um, <coughs> going from what is experienced to the principle and from the principle to what is experienced. And then if you go to the Middle Ages, 12, 1300, well, the Arabs picked this up and were very big on this. And then in the West, because 12, 1300, everybody's talking about this. The, the double method, there's a double way they call it. Because modern science develops from round about 1300 onwards. Modern, modern science actually developed in the West 500 years before we taught it did. It wasn't 1600, it was 1200, uh, well, 1600, it was about 500 years before. Um, I and mean, actually, funnily enough, when you get to Galileo, everybody, everybody said, well, Galileo and they got rid of Aristotle. Well, he, Galileo disagreed with Aristotle's conclusions, but he didn't disagree with his method. If you look in the um, second day of his book, Two New Sciences, where he deals with falling bodies, the, the kinetics, the kinematics of falling bodies. You will see there that he follows exactly the method that Aristotle follows, and he even uses the same general terms, as did Descartes, as did Newton. There was no, Aristotle had no disagreement, uh, Galileo had no disagreement with Aristotle about the methodology of science. It's just that for... for for, for Galileo, mathematics played a, a greater importance. What he disagreed with, Aristotle about, was the results. And again, people don't realise this, so they, they fail to see that science has got a very long history, um, a very long route indeed. And this continues right up until the modern period where you can follow the same thing through. But this led to, the, to this notion that there is a, a kind of common essence to all sciences. But now the whole thing's proliferated so much, it doesn't really, people work in whatever way they work, in accordance with the field in which they're working. And different regions of nature seem to have differently appropriate ways of working. And therefore, sciences now begin to diverge, and there is this kind of familiar, familial resemblance. So you don't have to think, n nobody now thinks in terms of this method of resolution and composition, which is what originally was called, where you go from the empirical uh, discoveries to the principle which could be the cause behind them, and then deduce the empirical back again from that cause. You go and look in Galileo, you'll see him do this beautifully. If you know Aristotle, you look aghast and you say, my God, that's exactly what Aristotle said. That's how you work. But he disagrees completely with Aristotle's results. Which is fine, because science is basically about disagreement. It's most important. Uh, here, Brian and I didn't really see it eye to eye. Um, he was very strong on this idea of science as consensus, into subjective consensus. And that's it's a side of it which is very important. But it's a side which can be overemphasized too much. So I think science is fundamentally about disagreement. Um, creative disagreement. Because... You can have your consensus and you can have your institutions and you can have all your people all agreeing about what they've achieved. And one man or one woman comes along and they have discovered something that upturns the apple cart completely. Now nobody will want to know and they'll have a terrible trouble. They'll try to exclude them, get rid of them and so on and that. But actually uh, science changes because of that. It only needs one person to see differently and eventually that person could turn out to have something more of the truth than the consensus had, in which case it changes. There's been an awful lot of emphasis on this consensus because of this idea of paradigm, <clears throat> a very unfortunate idea. A paradigm is fine in politics, where we have a, call it, a consensual government, isn't it? The cabinet reaches the consensus. So that means you really don't think you should go to war in Iraq, but you get up and say you do think that because actually you have a consensus in the cabinet and this sort of thing. That's what happens. That's what happens in science too when it's consensual. That's what's happened with Darwinism and so on and that. People say things which even no couldn't possibly be true. But it's for the sake of the consensus. 
and actually in quantum physics, but the history of it, you study it. Really, to understand science, what you need is social psychology first. Do social psychology, then study the history of science. And then come to the science. You'll get, to, you'll get a much better picture of what science is really like than the social psychology. <coughs> so, I think that uh, we don't want to think... Paradigms work for politics. There's a lot of work done now showing the whole paradigm notion just doesn't work for science. But you can represent science in such a way that it looks as if the paradigm story works. Even Kuhn, in the end, dropped the notion in his, his, his last and best book, the one on black body radiation. There's no mention of it. He was glad to get away from it. Because it backfired on him anyway, because he actually meant by, the, by it the opposite of what people thought he meant. So a bit of a tragic figure was for Kuhn. Anyway, it's another story. There's a lot of talk about paradigm. Oh, and this this really wretched stuff. A new paradigm. Please don't anyone mention new paradigms to me. Um, you can mention it when I've gone or out of my earshot. But it really does have a funny effect on me. We don't want a new paradigm. Because then we're like members of a political party. And it becomes a little in-group, like goldfish bowl. The goldfish, you know, love their goldfish bowl. And they have a strong sense of social coherence. Do you know why? Because they're all swimming round the same way. And if you all swim round the same way, you have a great feeling of belonging and being in possession of the truth. <laughs> it's rubbish. It's all a consequence of the social situation in which you are constrained. So groups form which have the truth, but they don't, because they've got themselves a little paradigm. And we're against that paradigm. And so it really is not, it's not a grown-up way to live. It's not a grown-up way to do science. Unfortunately, a lot of science tends to try to conform more to a form of politics than science. For those who want to know more about this, there is a brilliant book by Maura Bella, which is not an easy book to read because you have to have some background in quantum physics, but the book's called oh God, I can't quantum, quantum Dialogue. Uh, that, that misleads everybody because they think, oh, dialogue, that's lovely. Um, and it'll be about David Bowen, well it isn't, and by dialogue she doesn't mean what you think. But it deals with the development of quantum mechanics in the 1920s and Heisenberg and, and Bohr, which I was very interested in. And it has tremendous detail in it, but at the end, in the last two chapters of the book, she goes into what I have just been talking about now. And you can read those chapters and get from it stuff without having to have gone through everything before. Um, because you get a bit of a shock when you see where the notion of paradigm actually came from. Uh, I was very surprised, because I remember it all when it started. Um, because um, when Kuhn's book was published, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, Bohm had a whole term of seminars on it, and I was there at the time. So I read the book from day one, in fact, I read it twice. Um, and it's, it's the, the, you've got to remember in this business as in everything that wonderful um, saying I think it's, it's either from the Middle East or Pashtun saying or I don't know nothing is what it seems it's the most important thing to remember nothing is what it seems it's not cynical uh, actually it'll take you a long way nothing is what it seems and in this case with all the stuff about paradigms and so on it really is true. Nothing is what it seems. So we don't want a new paradigm or any kind of paradigm. We want creatively thinking people who, who differ creatively. And that means, of course, also being open to each other. That's what the true dialogue is. It's not, dialogue is not there to come to a consensus. If we just talk to each other enough, we'll come to think the same. Oh, that's not what it's about at all. It's a much more dynamic thing than that. So I'm not happy with this idea of science consensus. Is it, uh, is it gone? <laughs> <laughs> I don't touch it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't believe what you just said. <laughs> That's probably it. <coughs> well, that's probably uh, a bit of a mouthful. Um, but whenever I start this course, I, uh, I always feel like the, the, the Mullah Nazarene, you know, the story of the Mullah Nazarene, that um, the Mullah decided he wanted to take piano lessons. 
So he went to piano teacher and said, how much do piano lessons cost? This is a Middle Eastern story. He said, well, they, the first lesson is eight dirhams. They have dirhams in the Middle East, or they did then. Uh, that's it. Eight dirhams. Oh, I said, nah, because that's the, the first lesson is eight dirhams. So the mother said, oh, how much is the second lesson after that? And he said, oh, after that it's five dirhams. Oh, excellent, said the mother. I'll start with the second lesson. <laughs> now, I sort of always feel like that in giving this course. I'd like to start with the second lesson, because you know, it, it's easier. So what I've done is I've given you a kind of splurge. It's, 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 a, it's a splurge in, and I hope it's um, not been too confusing. Has it not been too confusing? Uh, might, of course. Um, uh, yes, well, there we are. Anyway, those who want to, it's worth looking at the end of Mara Bella's book. Last two chapters. And it's really quite interesting. Uh, you can get from it stuff without doing all the quantum physics. You can, you can put it off there. I'm quite keen on this idea of disagreement, creative disagreement. Uh, when it's done in the right way is the thing. Uh, the history of science abounds with examples, but I'm not going to tell you any. So they're running through my mind at the moment. It's quite surprising. And I'll stop. I'm not going to do that. <coughs> okay, now I'm going to, having done the first lesson, I'm now going to the second lesson, which costs less. Um, right, uh, I'm going to talk about my own background. Um, I'm going to slow down now as well. I'm going to talk about my own background. I don't really like doing this, but I can't find any way of, way of getting into what I want to do because I'm not an academic. I don't approach things academically. I've never had an academic job. People always think I'm an academic. It's annoying. They think I'm all sorts of things. I'm never any of the things. But I'm not an academic. But I do use things which are used by people in the academic world. That's why people expect, you know, me to be in there and so on. But I come at it from a quite different way. That's why sometimes I have to talk about my experience, because only that way can I get people to see, hey, look, you know, you can actually do this in your life. You don't have to go to university to do this kind of thing, which I think is rather important. <coughs> now, I, um, I, I'm writing a book. Well, I've written a book and I don't like it, so I'm going to have to redo it. Um, it's, it's, so that's, it's, that's, a, that's a problem. So <coughs> there we are. It's, the, book, the book is called The Dynamics of Being. Um, that's okay, I like the title. It works. And it's got a subtitle, which is From Phenomenology Through Goethe's Way of Science. Oh, you've just missed the first lesson. We now on to the second lesson. <coughs> You've missed the splurge. Never mind. <laughs> That's it. Now we're down to the dull stuff now. Um, you beat it all, do you think? Well, I'm not putting your leg, but there you are. That's it. So don't forget, science is based on disagreement. There are no paradigms. If you want paradigms, go into politics. Right? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's called The Dynamics of Being. <coughs> and the subtitle is From Phenomenology through Goethe's way of seeing <coughs> to hermeneutics <coughs> which will not please many of you you won't recognise some of the words but there it is phenomenology and hermeneutics are two of the, the major branches of European philosophy in the 20th century and a lot of work I do is in that context Goethe's way of seeing you'll understand now the title, uh, subtitle from phenomenology through Goethe's way of seeing to hermeneutics doesn't actually mean anything well, it's interesting the way in which it doesn't mean anything. It's interesting to me, you see, because <coughs> it enables me to bring up something else. Nothing is what it seems. Uh, the word metaphysics is a, is a big word. The people are into metaphysics. It's, wow, metaphysics. Wow, man, yeah. Uh, and it's got a long history, metaphysics. Going back, back to Plato and so on. Well, not quite Plato. Now, the word metaphysics, how does that word arise? Well, it's when the librarian, the chief librarian 
at the library in um, Alexandria before it got burned down, round about AD 150 or AD 200, was uh, cataloguing the works of Aristotle. And he started out, as librarians do, by putting on the shelf, in the most prominent place, the most popular works, which are not the most well-known works at all today, but they're actually there's works on politics, works on comedy, works on this, that and the other, things we don't even bother with. And then he worked his way through, <coughs> and he got to the sciences and to this stuff, De Anima and so on and that, and the physics. It's a book of Aristotle, a very important book called The Physics. And then he got this other stuff left over. And he put it on the shelf after the physics. Metaphysics. So metaphysics is a librarian's category term. And that's where it comes from. So hey, wow, well, man, metaphysics is really deep, isn't it? <laughs> it's a pretty library catalogue term. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. <laughs> oh dear, it's a lovely story that. So my, my subtitle is the same. Uh, it, it has no meaning. Um, it's a, from phenomenology through Goethe's way of science to hermeneutics. What it means is, if you read this book, you'll start off with some phenomenology, you'll then do Goethe's way of science, and then there's a bit on hermeneutics. And that's it. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything at all. So I, I wanted to explain that, because whenever I mention this to people, they say to me, well, I can't understand that subtitle. And the reason is, well, there's nothing there to understand. <laughs> it's like a, a library category term. It's just a, a list of stuff. Okay. So, and uh, now the important part. There is a quotation from Henry Bergson. And uh, shall I risk it in French? No, I won't. Philosophy consists in inverting the habitual direction of the work of thinking. Philosopher, or it's philosopher is to philosophize. Actually, that, that word in English is a very, very bad word to use. The English hate what they call philosophizing. So you must never do that. So you wouldn't say philosophizing consistent, because you, you, you've just done yourself down completely then. Um, so philosopher consists à invertir la direction habituelle du travail de la pensée. That's, that's a very important thing. That in, the idea I get from this is there is such a thing as doing philosophical work. And in doing philosophical work, you will invert the habitual direction of thinking. Um, and th that's actually different from philosophy. Because you can have an awful lot of philosophy that hasn't got any philosophical work in it at all. I've got books and books of philosophy with no philosophical work in. On the other hand, you can also have philosophical work without any philosophy. Wittgenstein didn't seem to know, or said he didn't, know any philosophy. But his philosophical work, his, his, to say it's exceptional, would be too mild. So they're not necessarily the same thing. And what I'm interested in is philosophical work. What that means, doing what doing philosophical work is. Because what happens is, oh, I better mention this, yes. Um, the thing is, with wholeness, people think it's somehow or other exceptional. But it's not. There's wholeness is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. I've already said lived experience is already holistic. It's just that we're not aware of lived experience. When we, when we are aware of experience with our common sense description, we describe experience as it seems after it has been lived. Oh, just ever such a tiny, tiny little fraction of a second after it's been lived. And we think, oh, that's the lived experience. It is lived, it's the past lived. But when you actually get into, and this is what phenomenology tries to do, is to get right into the lived experience as lived, then you find that it is already holistic. And guess what? It breaks apart in that tiny fraction of a second afterwards when it becomes experience that has been lived. Then it's broken apart. Then you come along and you say, wow, we must put this together. We must make this into a whole. Well, actually, it was a whole to begin with. Now you're really up the creek because you've taken a broken hole. You're in the Humpty Dumpty position, you see. For Humpty Dumpty was okay till he fell off the wall. 
Then along come some clowns and say, we must put him together again. And then we'll have Humpty Dumpty. Well, of course you haven't got Humpty Dumpty again. Because he was whole to begin with, you see. So this whole course is actually, when well, I think about it, I don't know, it's, it's about Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> actually, I might change that Bergson thing and put Humpty Dumpty on the front. <laughs> actually, that would be funny. Yes, that might do that. So it's good. <coughs> right. <coughs> <coughs> but the other thing about this is what I, what I find is that not only me but <coughs> when you go into this wholeness thing you find, what you find is it becomes intrinsically dynamic uh, you, you, there's a tendency with wholeness to treat it in a static or semi-static way but the real wholeness is to be found by going into what I call the dynamics of being. So in a certain sense, there's something which is more primary than the wholeness, and that's, the, that's a certain kind of dynamic, which is not a process in time, it's not a process at all. The, I'll come back to this later. The expression dynamics of being is ontological. The dynamics of being is ontological. And it might actually be the same as in time, but it's not actually temporal, because temporality comes from the dynamics of being. It's the dynamics of being which constitutes time, and therefore the dynamics of being cannot be in time. There's a bit of a mouthful, I know, but there you are. So there's, there's some... And this is a problem I have. It's one of the reasons why I don't like the book I've written. I'll tell you more about why I don't like it as I go along. Um, I don't think I've got it right. So why am I telling you about a book that I don't think is right? Well, <coughs> it's because of the difference between a very important thing now, the first important thing today is nothing is what it seems. Second important thing, the difference between a constructive conception and a dogmatic enunciation. And how we confuse these two. Um, <coughs> A constructive conception is a conception which has sufficient truthfulness in it to be useful in order to take you on further. It will also have in it untruthfulness. And that too is useful because when you become aware of that untruthfulness, trying to put that right also takes you on further. So that's a constructive conception. Now a dogmatic enunciation says this is true. That's, that's it. This is true. And for most of the time we treat things that are said by people as dogmatic enunciations. Then we can say, no it's not, and we can argue. See? But actually, this is not helpful, because particularly with philosophical work, almost everything is done in the spirit. You've got to look to the spirit, not the letter, in everything. Uh, that's the third important thing, yes. You know, look to the spirit of things, try to catch things in their spirit, that is to say, in their intention. I don't mean spirit in a spiritual sense. <coughs> in their intention, the spirit in which they were said, not in their actual expression. Uh, which will always contain in it um, distortions and uh, things which aren't right and so on and that. You, but you have to try to catch things in their intention. The very great German philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer, who you won't have heard of, um, who died in uh, 2002 at the age of 102. And I had the pleasure of meeting him when he was 86. Um, and what a man. Uh, he had this thing, he said, when you're trying to understand somebody, particularly if it's a written work, you always, he said, you always should try to take the other in their intention and not in their expression. But of course it's subtle as this, because you don't have access to their intention except through their expression. Which is not a point he overlooked. He's directing you to something which is actually much subtler than it seems. But this is something you can try to do. And you can learn this by trying it. When listening to somebody or reading something, try to take it, try to read the, in the spirit of the thing, as we would say in English, not in the letter. And so that's 
that's a very, very important principle. Uh, how in the hell did I get into that? What was I talking about? You know. Oh yes, that's right. That's right. It's it, thank you. It's this. This is everything I do. Therefore, is intended in the sense of a constructive conception. It's constructive because it could hope to take us somewhere, but it will have things in it which aren't right and are wrong and distortions and so on and that. Uh, it's not not intended to be a dogmatic enunciation. This is true. I um, I do not have access. Nobody actually has access to that kind of truth although many, many people think they do, and many people talk as if they did, the worst of all is we treat other people as if that's what they were doing. That's the really nasty part about this. Someone says something and you, oh no, no, you treat them as if they were making a dogmatic enunciation. And you do this before you've even noticed it, particularly if you're like me, argumentative. Um, then I do this with people, I, I haven't even noticed what I've done with them. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's important as this sound. Right. So I'm going to begin with the beginning. It's just a bit. bit it, it will. Yeah. I want to pick up a number of things also because this will also lead into the paper that you have read. <coughs> I'm going to read this bit. Um, not. Not. Yeah. I want to try and give some idea. I'm trying to get. Get. I, I've got to find a way of leading the reader in without saying this is a book on this, this and this. Because then it's, it's categorised and it's academic and so on and that. This is a book about a different way of thinking. The dynamic way of thinking, which is the general name I'm going to give it, first appears in European thought around the beginning of the 19th century in the Romantic movement and the philosophy of German idealism. It's always called German idealism. It's a very bad name. <coughs> Here, as always... It takes a form that is specific to the particular circumstances in which it appears. Confusing the container with the content, as we so often do, next important point, means that inevitably we end up focusing too much attention on the specific form which this way of thinking takes in a particular instance, and consequently fail to see the more universal content which is the movement of thinking itself. Am I going too fast? Can you follow this? Can you, um, blank, blank, yeah. blank yeah. everywhere. <laughs> Good. Okay. So I'm saying this first appears in European thought around the beginning of the 19th century, so at about 1800. The Romantic movement, Goethe obviously, German idealism, Hegel obviously. Here, as it all, as always, as it always does. This form of thinking, it takes a form, this form of thinking takes a form that is specific to the particular circumstances in which it appears. So at the beginning of the 19th century, it takes a form which is specific to that period of time and the people who are doing it. Confusing the container with the content, as we so often do. Now, this is the big thing. We almost invariably, what we take to be the content of something is actually the container. The true content is carried by that container, but we don't notice it. It's like in, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the radio. Do you call it radio these days? Look, is that the name? Of the right. Radio. Mm. The radio. Um, well, I always say, no, it's all right laughing, but it's I refer to the gramophone, and everyone fell about laughing. <laughs> right? I still have a gramophone. Yes. Uh, the um, radio, radio waves are transmitted, and imposed upon them, there is a modulation. That modulation has the same pattern as the audio signal you want to transmit. When it gets to the receiver, you get rid of the radio waves and you take off that modulation, which is the sound. So the radio waves disappear. The radio waves are merely the carrier. Now, very often, what happens with what I'm saying here is that if you look at the kind of thinking done by Goethe, the Romantics, and so on, they, that material, what they do, acts as a carrier wave for something. But we don't notice that 
we take what they do as the content and say this is the content. But the real content is the way of thinking, which what they do is acts as the carrier wave. But we identify with them, and that's what the academic does, so it then spends 30, 40 years studying this in great detail, what did go to have for his breakfast on the blah, 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 and so on and all that. But actually, that, that, what we take to be the content, is the carrier wave, is the carrier, the container, so the container for the way of thinking. And we have to, again, we have to invert it and learn to take off the true content, which in this case is the way of thinking, not the apparent content, which is all the stuff you'd have to learn about if you were going to do it academically. Does it make some sense now? And this happens a great deal. And this confusion of container and content is something which, if we could just get past this, we could learn a great deal. There's a great deal more going on. For example, you could approach the internet in this way, and you could ask yourself, well, you know, you can, you can invert the well and <coughs> Uh, confusing the container with the content as we so often do means that inevitably we end up focusing too much attention on the specific form which this way of thinking takes in a particular instance and consequently fail to see the more universal content which is the movement of thinking itself is that a bit better now? <coughs> the dynamic where <coughs> oh well the dynamic way of thinking appears again in European philosophy in the first part of the 20th century in the philosophy of phenomenology and hermeneutics <coughs> but once again we are too easily seduced by the specifics of the occasion to notice the more universal element that is the dynamic way of thinking but divergent as these philosophical movements may seem outwardly and they are divergent they nevertheless belong together when they are seen in terms of the movement of thinking which each expresses in its own different way the significance of this dynamic way of understanding so easily gets lost in the obfuscations of philosophers who in their endless attempts to justify what they are doing all too often succeed only in covering it over with the dense layer of what to others seem to be just impenetrable jargon. The vision gets lost. <coughs> what is left <coughs> descends into an intellectual exercise which turns round upon itself endlessly until it ceases to be of interest to any but a few. This is such a pity, because there is something here which is potentially of much wider interest and which needs to be brought out. I believe this can be done by taking a more concrete approach. This is what I want to try to do here. So that's part of the preface. That's what I'm doing. And I'm finding the material for this in this philosophical tradition. I find it part of it in Goethe, and I find the other part of it in Phenomenology and Hermeneutics, and I use it. But in fact, uh, when I do this, then there's a problem, because people think I'm dealing with Goethe, they think I'm dealing with Phenomenology, they think I'm dealing with Hermeneutics, and what I'm actually interested in is the dynamics of being, which is what the title says. And the dynamics of being is exemplified in Phenomenology, and, and, and but it's not the same in each case. Um, and it's quite difficult sorting it out. <coughs> because <coughs> that's where I want to get to. And that is, brings us to a much more dynamical form of wholeness, a more dynamic expression of wholeness. That way, you, you can really, with this dynamics, you can really see the wholeness, and you can see how the wholeness is continually disappearing. Because I'm interested in the wholeness which is ubiquitous. I'm interested in the wholeness which is, which is there already all the time. That's philosophical work, that's what you do. And I'm saying that actually um, wholeness is everywhere. It's the commonest thing there is. So why are we all here looking for wholeness when it's the commonest thing there is? Well, either I'm a crackpot, uh, which is perfectly possible, 
or else there's something else that's actually getting in the way here. And that's, that's, that, this is the region area in which I work, and this is what I'm trying to bring out. But it, uh, it gets more, it's very difficult because, uh, well, it's obviously very difficult. Because you're not constantly, it's not like doing quantum field theory. The thing with quantum field theory is if you can do the mathematics, quantum field theory is easy. This is much harder than quantum field theory because it involves, it's like you've got to take a head and turn it round. <coughs> you know, and it's, it's, it's very difficult. And just when you think you've succeeded, it flips back again. You can try that with your own head. You get it round so far, it flips back again, it doesn't want to go. <laughs> An easier way of doing it is to contemplate the figure of the reversing cube. You all know the figure of the reversing cube. Of course you do. <laughs> right. First diagram. Uh, There's a reversing cube. How many ways can you see that? How many cubes can you see that? There's only one cube. I've only drawn one cube. There's only one cube. How many can you see? Two. Yeah. yeah. You can see it in which uh, this is the front face here. And it seems to be coming out this way. And you can see it in which that is the front face there. It appears to be going up that way. Now, most people find with this that they can actually uh, they can actually see one of these very easily, mm -hmm. <coughs> and they have to work to get to the other one. And they oh, it's gone, oh, it's gone back again, and that's a very good illustration. There's a default mode, and we have a default mode. In the stuff that I've just been talking about. That you can get to the point when you suddenly see it, as they turn you, it's got to turn your head around and suddenly it splits back again. And you go, oh, I've got it, oh, it's gone. <laughs> because it's like this. What, we're, what we're, I'm concerned with is just seeing everything that we ordinarily see anyway, but suddenly seeing it in, this, in a different way. And then realizing, my goodness, it's already a hole. The whole wholeness is already here. Oh, it's gone. And that's where the problem is. In fact, lived experiences like this, because this is the one people usually say, we said that lived experiences in English is a good phrase because it's ambiguous. Because it's the past tense, lived experience. It's also the present tense, lived experience. So I would put lived experience past here and lived experience as the living present here. Almost all our thinking is in terms of the past, which we think is the present. Then when you finally get this thing, you think, oh my god, oh, it's gone back again. <laughs> That's it. And you've got to change the description so that you're actually working there, you're seeing there, you're working there, and you're continually flipping back into the default mode. And this is the part that's holistic, and this is the part which is um, analytical, separate, there's separation here. This is pre-separation, the separation here. And then you start with the separation, you think, oh my goodness, this separation is terrible. I must put things together and make them hope. Hopeless. You're already too late. You see. So this is what I'm concerned with doing, or trying to bring out, trying to help us all to see, including myself. Um, and it's actually very concrete. When, when it happens, it's concrete, but in order to get it to happen, you often have to work with a lot of material that doesn't look concrete. That's the hard part of it. Um, so... There, I hope you can make some sense of that. Oh, what time is it? <coughs> Can't escape yet. No. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, oh, good. I will talk about the background here. Uh, a bit about this background. Uh, so don't get through this quickly, because then I can get on to the... Mm. My own introduction to European philosophy came through an unusual route. I had been working in a small research group investigating more effective ways of communicating ideas in education. At the time, the late 1960s and early 1970s, there was a growing interest in the UK in management education and organisational development. The kind of methods for more effective communication which we were researching turned out to be also of interest here. 
in fact more so than in mainstream education, where institutional constraints sometimes made innovation difficult. This was the time when systems theory, with a capital S, capital T, was very much in vogue in the world of management and organisation. And I want to say, whenever I say systems theory, it's got nothing to do with nonlinear dynamical systems, which is a mathematical theory. I'm talking about what's all meant by systems thinking. Come back to that later. Diagrams were much in evidence, usually consisting of words in boxes joined together by lines to represent connections. The aim of systems thinking was to move away from the emphasis on the idea of basic building blocks towards the idea of the overall order of the organisational form. We've got that. Move away from the emphasis on the idea of basic building blocks towards the idea of the overall order of the organisational form. In the eyes of various theorists, especially von Bertalamfi, who you won't have heard of, but he was very famous, it was believed this would lead to a general science of wholeness, which would be a universal science of organisation that would apply equally to all forms of organisation irrespective of differences in kind, that is, whether they be physical, chemical, organic, ecological, psychological, sociological, cultural or historical. It seemed to me that although the claim was made that systems thinking is holistic and therefore non-reductionistic, it is in fact much more reductionistic in practice than many of the optimistic pronouncements about it would lead us to suppose. And here I'd like to just uh, digress slightly for a minute because um, I, I, I put a note in there because I was very struck by this because I, I realised that systems thinking is actually no different Everyone, everyone said in the 60s, everyone was very full of this. The system, at last, there is a science of wholeness, and it's called systems thinking. And I thought this was wrong. And I, I, I paid quite a heavy price for it. I mean, <clears throat> I was told I was told in my job that if I didn't actually uh, my, didn't actually agree more with people, then I'd lose my job. I, I, it was, I wouldn't agree about the systems wholeness, you see which is a bit difficult because they've got two young children and that sort of thing, you know. So uh, I sort of systems theory is a form of fascism to me. But anyway, never mind, a totalitarianism. I'll come back to that later. Um, <clears throat> systems thinking is often presented as a revolution in thinking that overcomes the limitations of the Cartesian paradigm of analytical thinking that has been central to modern thought. In some ways, this is undoubtedly true. In the Cartesian paradigm, the behaviour of the whole can be reduced to the behaviour of the parts, for example, whereas the very opposite is the case in systems thinking. However, in another respect, systems thinking has a surprising affinity with Descartes' methodological goal. So much so, in fact, that it could be, even be called the ultimate fulfilment of Descartes' dream or Descartes nightmare, whichever way you want to look at it. The failure to recognise this is a consequence of selecting only part of Descartes' work for attention instead of seeing it more comprehensively. What was central for Descartes was his dream of a mathesis universalis, a universal mathematics, which would be in effect a 17th century unified science or theory of everything. Having shown that problems in geometry could be as expressed as problems in algebra, so that figures could be eliminated from geometry and replaced by equations, thereby unifying what until then had been thought to be two different sciences, that's what he calls them, he believed it must be possible to go further in the direction of unification by eliminating quantity itself from mathematics. The resulting universal science could then apply to any subject matter whatsoever. He says, I came to see that the exclusive concern of mathematics is with questions of order and measure, and that it is irrelevant whether the measure in question involves numbers, shapes, stars, sounds, or any object whatsoever. This made me realize that there must be a general science 
which explains all the points that can be raised concerning order and measure irrespective of the subject matter and that science should, such a science should be termed mathesis universalis universal mathematics so you're, you, you, you have a science of overall form of things which takes no account of what things are and this dream of a unified science emerged again in the 1920s some 300 years later <coughs> among the philosophers and scientists who were part of what came to be known as the Vienna Circle some of these, notably Rudolf Conner <coughs> believed that the, the, <coughs> the different sciences including psychology and sociology could be unified, unified by effectively reducing all the sciences to physics since this is the science closest to pure mathematics. Although this suggestion may seem very strange to us today, this gross reductionism was embraced, embraced enthusiastically by some until the 1960s. However, another member of the Vienna Circle, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, advocated a different approach, different approach, which led eventually to what he called general systems theory, capital G, capital S, capital and this was very famous in the time I'm talking about. Instead of producing unification by reducing all sciences ultimately to the method of physics, von Bertalanffy proposed a mathematical science of general systems, which would apply to all systems irrespective of their nature. He said that, just as the mathematical theory of probability deals with chance events as such, <coughs> irrespective of their nature, so general systems theory <coughs> would deal with organised wholes as such, irrespective of their nature. It would apply to all the sciences, physical, biological, psychological, sociological, and even to history. As he put it, quote, the unity of science is granted not by a utopian reduction of all sciences to physics and chemistry, but by the structural uniformities of the different levels of reality. If we compare this with the statement made by Descartes concerning the idea of a mathesis universalis, even allowing for the differences between them as a consequence of their being 300 years apart, <coughs> von Bertalanffy's science of, quote, the structural uniformities of the different levels of reality, end of quote, sounds very similar to Descartes' Quote, general science of order and measure irrespective of the subject matter, end of quote. <coughs> it seems that, unbeknown to him, von Bertalanffy was pursuing the same ideal that was first introduced into modern Western thinking by Descartes. This is ironic, because there are many today who believe that it was systems thinking which first overcame the reductionism so often associated with the name of Descartes. And when I spotted the similarity between what Descartes said and what von Bertalanffy said, I just could not believe my eyes. Because I lived through this stuff and I knew it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't about wholeness. And everyone said it was. And they drew these diagrams with boxes with words in them and linking them up. And I could see that this wasn't wholeness. And this is the counterfeit wholeness that I actually talk about. And I will later mention why I chose that word and what I had in the back of my mind. Because in the paper you've read, what I haven't come clean about, because I couldn't do, is what I had in mind when I wrote that. And what I was actually getting at, which was this kind of thinking. But since the people who were publishing it were the people I was working with anyway, who I was opposed to, you have to be a bit careful, you know. This is not so I, I didn't actually... But all you have to do is read between the lines. And, and the context in which it was written, it was seen as being a highly subversive paper. Because it was actually saying uh, system theory is not, not, is not authentic, it, it's counterfeit. Now, the, I'm not going to say any more about this, but the thing is, <coughs> there's, that, that's, there's gross reductionism and the, the subtle reductionism. Von Berthel and the, it's, it's actually a reductionist picture, but it's subtle. And my point is, it's no different to what Descartes said. Descartes, you see, therefore we can say what well, Descartes was much more visionary than people think. And it was. Um, and, but to, to, to see the limitations in the, this wider version of systems theory, this more subtle theory, the reduction to physics, that's gross reductionism. A lot of people think that's reductionism. It's not. There's a more subtle form of reductionism, and you've just heard it. 
And I would recommend to you the discussion of this and uh, showing about this, which is extremely clear in Ken Wilber's Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, a book you'll all know, of course. Um, and it's pages 114 to 118, 129 to 133. <clears throat> yes, Ken Wilbur. Uh, everyone here will know Ken Wilbur. He's a great hero of everyone who's concerned with all these things, isn't he? Yes. Thank goodness for that. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not mad keen. <clears throat> I have read, I've read this book. And I think there's many, many very good things in it. There's some things that don't agree with but <coughs> Sex ecology, spirituality. Again, that's another one of these titles which doesn't mean anything. It's a catchy title. It's, what he's saying is I've got everything here. It's like sex, drugs and rock and roll. And he's, I've got it all in here. Uh, if, 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 you know, it covers everything that people are interested in. You know, and, and so that's it. And that's, where, that, that's why the title's there. It doesn't, you know. Uh, can you repeat the pages? Yes, I can. Page, pages 114 to 118. Pages 129 to 133. And I think you will find those very interesting as a critique of this more general form of systems theory, which I have just um, just done the, the, by pointing out that what Bert, Von Bertel Ampe said is pretty much the same as what Descartes said. And so the claim that this is now a science of organised holds which overcomes the way Descartes separated everything into component parts is patently nonsense. Um, and this, of course, you see, was one of the areas, and the reason why it was one of the areas in which this whole idea of wholeness really came in in the 1960s, came in in management and systems theory. This is, this is wholeness. And they believed that they were dealing with wholeness. Now, just to finish off this morning, I didn't. Um, my main concern was with the claim that systems theory is a science of wholeness. This concern arose out of my experience as a postgraduate research student in physics at Birkbeck College early in the 1960s, where I worked on the problem of wholeness in quantum theory, in the quantum theory. It had become clear that a fundamentally new way of thinking was needed for quantum physics, even though such a possibility had been explicitly denied by Niels Bohr in what was referred to as the Copenhagen interpretation of the quantum theory, which had become the most widely accepted view among physicists as a result of Bohr's extraordinary persuasiveness. <coughs> Social psychology to the fore here, I can tell you. Uh, but David Bohm believed this could be done, that is, you could find new concepts. He, he pointed to examples which he said could function as templates for a new way of <coughs> sorry <coughs> templates <coughs> for a new way <coughs> of thinking about wholeness. One of these was the hologram, which at the time in question was a technological innovation. I mean I'm talking about nineteen sixty two here. The hologram had only just come in. Lasers had only just come in. So the hologram was really new, new, new. You see, this is one of the advantages of being old. There aren't many. But one of them is you can remember what's happened. Um, and you get a sense of... You get a sense of the... You know, <coughs> the extended body of things. This appealed to the imagination. Because unlike a photographic plate where each point of the image on the plate corresponds approximately to a point on the object that's been photographed. With a hologram, each part of the plate contains information about the whole object. So in a certain sense, the whole object is actually there in each part. And not only that, so instead of localised parts with a hologram, the whole is present in each part, and each part is distributed throughout the whole. And this gives an image of, uh, of, uh, of wholeness, which is very different from the image of wholeness in systems theory 
this org this organized holes and so on and that. It's a very different image completely. And I was very lucky I was there and Bohm was exploring this and that's at the time when I was there, nineteen sixty two to sixty four. And I, of course this and I was wor working on the problem of Horus and Bohr's objections to it and so on and that. <coughs> and this this image was completely different. So when later on I found myself involved with this research group in education and management education and organization development and this emphasis on system theory is the science of wholeness, I thought, what a load of bollocks. It's nothing of the kind. Am I allowed to say that on this machine? Or I? Okay, fine. He's fallen asleep. <coughs> this nothing of the kind. And what, what's needed, therefore, is some kind of understanding of wholeness which is much more like the hologram and uh, that I will talk about briefly. It's just about lunchtime. Um, what I will do next, I will talk about that, how we use that and how that led from there. It's been a bit of a, I hope it's not been too boring, a bit of a long-winded introduction, but the thing is I think it's essential to, <clears throat> one tends always to skip over these things and take it as being read. And that's dawned on me over the last couple of years that it, you can't take it as being read because people haven't had the kind of background experience I've had. And so, you know, I, I would assume, oh, well, they all know about system theory now, that's wrong. And I wouldn't mention it. But I think I, it's probably better to do so. I hope you think so. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm reading this because there's a lot of stuff in it, and the stuff is important. I'm not reading this because I've written it. It's not an easy go <laughs> trip. <laughs> uh, but I will there next time. And when is next time? At 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So they're busy this afternoon. Um, yeah, Marion's coming. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that. Right, I'm fine with that. I just want to uh, turn up tomorrow morning. Is there the possibility then of something tomorrow afternoon? Uh, I think so. Yes. If we need it. Check on the time. See, I did this last year. I looked at my diary from last year. You know. I know. Please oh, yes. do an extra. Yeah, I do, do an extra bit in the afternoon, even though it does me in, because I'm no good in the afternoon. But at four o'clock onwards or five, I can do. Um, and because uh, I need to catch up and I like to take it fairly slowly as you know because otherwise people don't, can't understand um, is that okay? okay well we'll try tomorrow then we'll count 10 o'clock and I'll talk about about how we use this and that will lead into what I want to say so it'll be alright then we'll, we'll get to the dynamics and then we'll get to them. you'll be so happy by tomorrow afternoon Because there's, there's only a few days, it's not long. Is there? Well, long enough. Any questions? Yes, yes. Um, I'm just curious about the real origin of holistic. Is it just a totally new term, or it's coming from Latin or something? Well, it probably, yeah, well, it would have been coined from Latin, probably. But yes, it must have been. But it's, it was a new term. Mm -hmm. And there's no... At least as far as I know it is... I mean, I was there, around, and it, we just never heard that word until the beginning of the 1970s, when it came from the people doing brain research in California. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not... I, I also learnt it's not actually there in German. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not an equivalent. Well, there is a word, but it was never used. But when you go to the origin of it, can you really search and see where it's coming from? Uh, when you say, the, what do you mean by the original? Oh. You think the etymology? The etymology. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 you, you would be able to, yes. I, I, I don't know, it must be... It's just it, interesting. It, well, I think it would be, it, it's probably Greek, isn't it? It's Greek. It's Greek. Holos. 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 It's Greek. Ah, Holos? It's Greek. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, it's Greek. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you really think society could get to a point where we could operate without a paradigm? Like, because that's sort of how we organize <coughs> Well, I think, um, I mean, when I said all those things about paradigms, I wanted to upset you. Um, <laughs> that's the real <laughs> the thing was. Um, <coughs> I, I, the thing is that um, I think if people read, read the little bit I mentioned in Mara Bella's book, it would be very useful. You will see what the limitation of the paradigm notion is. Um, and I'm not saying, no, we don't have that. 
but it can be very limiting and we need to, I think we need to know that um, I mean and I, I used the word in the first paragraph you see um, it is it has a certain it's coming to the language but it, it, it can become very conformist and I mean I, I am a, me a member of the scientific and medical network I, only in the sense that I pay them a subscription every year and they send me a, a magazine because I don't actually like what they do um, and um, I don't like the way they do it and they're full of this stuff that they're developing a new paradigm and you know and you look at it and you think well no this is not the way to go because all you'll do is produce a new system of conformity that's all you'll do it seems so obvious to me um, that the real thinking is not at that level. Do please, have you got Marla Bella's book? You probably won't have. No, you won't have it because it's, it's a bit special. It's worth having uh, for that. She got a prize for a big, big international prize for the book. It really is worth having here. Yeah. Um, there are several bits in it, but actually that final couple of chapters is so useful. You know, but probably shortage of money. And, Anyway, we're going to turn it into a dog food factory, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't people need that system? Sorry? But don't people, like most people who don't want to spend their time thinking about everything, need that system, like a system of conformity? <coughs> well, yes, you see, and there obviously are many situations where a system of conformity is, is appropriate in institutions and so on, everything becomes institutionalized. And we cannot actually live without institutions. We would collapse without institutions. So you're completely right. <coughs> but if we think <coughs> that, that, that that's the ceiling, then we're very that we're in trouble. We are in trouble. Um, and that there is more and there's possibility of further kinds of developments. But then maybe it always happens. Then those further developments, which are quite new, are then turned into new paradigms. So they, this is what the, my criticism of the network is, they want to do this. I, I just don't feel that... It, anyway, it's actually, um, there's something autocratic about it. There's something um, arrogant about wanting to have a new paradigm which you can impose on people. Um, I think there's something, there's something fishy about the whole idea. It, you know, it doesn't allow people to think for themselves. But within institutions, then there's going to be... Of course, paradigm, you see, originally is a grammatical term. A moment, mass, a mat, a marmus, a martis, a mat is a paradigm of first conjugation verbs. That's it. And that's what the word paradigm meant. That's where it comes from. It comes from grammar. So you just take that one example and you say all first declension verbs, first conjugation verbs, go like that. Oh, except there's some that don't. Okay? And that's called the paradigm. And that's where it actually comes from. Well, obviously there's nothing wrong with that. If, whenever you get a job and you move into a new office or something like that, there's a kind of paradigm there, which is how we do things here. Now, you couldn't get a job and walk and say, yeah, no, I don't want to know about that. I'm going to do things in the most disciplined way I can. I mean, you'll be out by lunchtime, you know. And what's more, the firm wouldn't work. So you, and one needs a sense of proportion. But what I'm saying is, if we're concerned with developing an understanding, is that the right place for paradigms? Or is it restrictive? I actually think it's very often restrictive. On the other hand, I don't, uh, I don't I'm, not, I'm not advocating anarchy. Perhaps all I'm saying is uh, consensus has been emphasised far too much, uh, especially in science, and you get consensus in politics. And then science becomes like politics. And people have commented on this how it's become institutionally very similar to politics. And that's because it works in this way. Yeah? Yeah, just on that, on that point that in medicine, the consensus is uh, absolutely stifling and uh, is an incredible block towards science and, yes. and truth. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I think most people can recognise what I'm trying to say here. But when that began, become, what they don't realise is that one of the current main philosophies of science effectively advocates that. I mean, we had it in this country about global warming, um, but we know a lot, we know a lot of fraudulent stuff came came from the IPCC. We know that. Uh, I've read the book and all that business, and I've gone through a lot of the data. 
and it's just staggering what, what they're trying to get away with. So they've actually screwed the whole picture because now people think, oh, well, perhaps there isn't global warming. It's because the, the way, because they, they demanded conformity. And all their papers that were published and so on were, were reduced to this kind of conformity. Even in cases where in the Antarctic they had two measurements and they generalised on two measurements for the whole of the Antarctic. And it turned out one of the measurements, and the sensor got covered in snow, and so it was wrong anyway. <laughs> so, they called it sparse data infill. That's their jargon. So what it gives it away? When the data is sparse, you fill in how with your computer program. Your computer program has already got a pattern for the whole thing, and so you fill in the data that you want. And they called it sparse data infill, and thought that you know this that chap. Pat Shryer, whatever his name is, thought that people were going to actually be taken in by this. I mean, so there you've got the, the demand has been appalling there, and the whole thing has been run much more like politics. What I can't believe is how quickly it's changed. Because the Royal Society was terrible. The Royal Society saw itself as having to promote the orthodox dogma on global warming. Within a few months it had changed its mind, because I thought it was disgusting the way the Royal Society was operating. Within a few months it had changed its mind and said, no, we need to look at this more carefully. Uh, so something happened somewhere. So, <coughs> well, which doesn't mean, of course, there isn't global warming. <laughs>